for sports sociology, where we really focused on people in sports. I want to talk a little bit about participation factors. There are many ways to address participation in sport and physical activity. Up to this point, we've tried to use sociology as a lens to structure our discussion. Some of these ideas that we draw from sociology and apply to sport and physical activity include understanding roles, social structure, different patterns, trends, generalizations, those types of things. We'll attempt to address and understand in this particular lecture how how those ideas of, of structure and roles and expectations are associated with sport and physical activity participation. We'll also look at factors impacting not only sport participation but sport consumption as well. It's also worth noting that when talking about these different participation factors we really think back to the ideas that come out of sport management business, communication, and then other social justice type literatures. And that's the idea of diversity. Within diversity, there are a lot of different ways of categorizing differences between people. But two main ways that you can think about diversity involve deep level and surface level characteristics. Deep level diversity characteristics are going to be those things that are not easily visible on the outside of the person. This might be something like social heritage ethnicity perhaps, um, socioeconomic status. Surface level tends to be things that's going to be much more noticeable. These might be physical differences like race and gender differences or differences in terms of ability levels or ages. So keep in the back of your mind that when we deal with sociology and we deal with these participation factors really what we're talking about as well are issues of diversity. The rationale for trying to take all of these discussions that deal with aspects of diversity really centers on this idea of trying to understand sport and physical activity patterns, trends, and generalizations. This might be something like sport participation or consumption rates through the SBR net um, sports discuss and some of those resources through the WSU library. You're actually able to look at the types of participation rates in a lot of different sports or consumption rates of different sports all different levels throughout all of North America and that's really what we're talking about if we say that uh, 74 percent of those individuals that watched the NBA draft this year also had a second screen experience meaning they watched perhaps on TV but then also followed message boards or live coverage via Twitter on a on a mobile device all right that's that's a participation that's a consumption rate. Obesity rates are another way of really trying to understand patterns, trends, and generalizations associated with something like physical activity. There are many personal, cultural, and social factors that are associated with sport and physical activity participation. And that's why we want to look at them. Sport commands a disproportionate amount of attention and awareness, especially in, in American culture, and we really want to try to isolate and understand the individual and collective impact that these factors have on different levels of sport or physical activity consumption. Drawn upon the basic epistemological foundations, not just from sociology, but also social science in general, we're going to talk about four main participation patterns, trends, and generalizations. One is going to involve gender, the other race and ethnicity. Additionally, we'll talk about socioeconomic status or class. And then finally, we'll look at the able-bodied, disabled sport dichotomy to try to understand some of the patterns and trends there. I really enjoy this graphic. And for those of you that are listening or are not able to view this particular graphic, essentially what it is, it's a funnel. And in the funnel, you have the circle of gender, race, and disability, which are three of the four participation factors that we're going to talk about. All right, Those three things are in a funnel, and that funnel really kind of narrows down to this whole idea of participation and consumption. But what I really, what I really enjoy about this graphic is when I created it, I put socioeconomic status outside of the funnel. 
And the reason it's outside the funnel, we know that race and gender and disability and age and a host of other factors really kind of, it's more like stew as compared to a salad. All these things really kind of meld together in social life and it's really hard to isolate the impact one has over the other. One participation factor is not more important than the other. Except the reason I have socioeconomic status or social class on the outside is that from sociological literature, what we know is that socioeconomic status is the single most important factor in the quality of life of individuals both here in the United States and also around the world. All right, and so I've isolated it outside of that funnel to show that socioeconomic status really is almost that funnel that some of these other participation factors kind of swirl within. All of these things work together to really help us explain participation and consumption of sport and physical activity. Let's talk a little bit about gender. We know that gender ideologies are ingrained in both society and sports. An example of a gender inequity in society is simply the gender wage gap. Here in the United States, women have been making less than men for decades. It varies every single year, and you can use information from the current population survey, which is the um, nationally representative database that's developed by the U.S. Census Bureau every year between the Diennial Census. And what we find is that women make about 70 to 75 percent of every dollar that a male makes here in the United States. So if I, as a man, make one dollar, then other women make 70 to 75 cents. Oftentimes we're doing the same types of jobs. We also know that where women tend to be clustered in terms of occupations, those positions tend to be paid less. We've talked about this before, gender ideologies in sports, and for a very long time, and I, you know, I, I'm glad to say that it seems like some of these ideas are changing, but for a very long time, the old adage, if a boy, if you're kind of making fun of him, they would say, oh, he throws like a girl. The implication being in that particular statement that if you threw like a girl, then that was undesirable. Well, as we try to understand those ideologies, where they come from, how they develop, how they perpetuate, and then hopefully how to change them, we need to understand some of the basics. And oftentimes this comes with developing a vocabulary. Gender and sex are not the same thing. Gender deals with cultural characteristics or how we think of masculinity and femininity in a particular culture or society. Sex deals with the physiological, the biological differences between males and females. While both have their place in a discussion, in social science, especially in sociology, we tend to err on the side of caution and speak about gender. And the reason is, one, we don't know necessarily the physiological differences between people unless they volunteer that information, but two, those cultural characteristics and the definitions of masculinity and femininity, those really are at the heart of what it is that we're talking about. Also, one of the biases when thinking about gender that feminism, for example, has been trying to address is that oftentimes we think in a what we call a binary system, man and woman. Well, what about individuals who don't necessarily see the world in a, in a binary system or a binary way? If you have people that are transgendered, if you have people that may physiologically be a male, but some of their sexual orientation is different as compared to the expectations of this binary system. And so that's, when we talk about gender and gender bending and things like that, it's just much more flexible and allows us to really dive into this interplay between masculinity, femininity, and the expectations that we have in sport. Now, I'm not going to click on this particular video down here, but if you get some time, feel free to kind of click on it, and, it, and it's kind of looking at just the, it's a, it's a trailer for a show that aired years ago, and it's just really highlighting the kind of historical origins of combat sports and how that tended to be associated not just culturally, but also sociologically with masculinity. So as a result, when people say that women that participate in physical sports, there's something different and something unique about that, especially if you look back historically. This is kind of what they're talking about. These ideas of femininity and masculinity were set 
potentially hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of years ago, and they're very slow to change. And that's kind of what that video is showing, is that sort of the historical origins of how sport and masculinity were combined early, early on. For us in the world of sport management especially, now it does have an impact for those that are working in, in more of a, a fitness sector, but really uh, for those that are involved in high school athletics or intercollegiate athletics, Title IX was a very, very important milestone in the world of gender and sport. I have a video on there of Karen Morrison from the NCAA, and so again, feel free to click on there and watch this short video. We're not going to do it in this particular presentation so that we can kind of get everything within the 25-30 minutes that I would like to do, but it's very short and it really kind of outlines the three-prong test and how you can be compliant to Title IX, the rationale for Title IX, where it comes from, those types of things. And what when we start thinking of Title IX as sort of framework in this discussion of sport participation or consumption in regards to males and females here in the United States, one of the things that we see is this focus on unequal participation rates. And this is interesting because we've there's been dramatic progress made in girls, women being involved in sports. Now, progress is not success, and that's that's going to be sort of the, the thing that frameworks everything here, is that if you look at since Title IX was enacted and applied to the world of sport roughly four decades ago, you've seen an increase in female participation rates. What we've also noticed is that consumption rates are extremely unequal. Women's sports, generally speaking, are not as highly consumed and as a result there are, there are pay discrepancies, for example. Now, historically, going back to 1996, when you had the development of the WNBA, people have talked about WNBA player salaries and NBA salaries. But maybe even more recently, 2016, 2017, let's look at the discrepancy in U.S. men's national team and U.S. women's national team soccer team members and their pay rates. The men's team, which is arguably um, doesn't bring in as many consumers and viewers from around the United States, was paid substantially more than the U.S. women's national team. Why is that? And that's kind of the crux of everything. Why do we have some of these inequities? Another area when you start thinking about gender and sport, um, whether you're talking about professional sports, uh, scholastic, collegiate athletics, or even sometimes if you're looking into the world of recreation or other physical activity based organizations, is you have a lack of representation of female coaches or female administrators. And how is that to change? Now you're talking about structural, cultural changes. You're talking about trying to get more young women involved in the administrative aspect of sport earlier in their career. We see this in the Department of Sport Management. You know, when you start thinking about we have a predominantly male undergraduate and graduate program. Now at the graduate level, it's much more equal than it is at the undergraduate level. Why is that? So when we start thinking about recruiting students, there are a lot of different issues and factors that we have to address in terms of trying to evolve and provide equal representation or equal opportunity within not just academic programs, but also eventually into the sport industry. Now, not everything is so bleak. Acosta and Carpenter who have been doing periodic research on Title IX almost since its inception are very famous and well known for tracking um, job market participation rates, things like that associated with um, you know boys versus girls participation rates, young men versus young women, and all different age groups and things like that. And their assertion back in 2014 is that this is the best sports job market ever for females. Now again that's progress. Is it equal success? We know that, for example, as a case study, if you look at NCAA women's basketball teams, the majority of the coaches for these women's basketball teams in the NCAA are men as compared to women. Now the question is, is that good or is that bad? A lot of it depends upon, again, your point of view and your perception. You could say that's a good sign because that means men are matriculating to the women's game and see it as just as positive, just as 
uh, impactful as the men's game and they want to be a part of it. Or you could say, even in, within women's basketball, women coaches and administrators are not able to get uh, a fair shot, no pun intended there, um, in regards to having access to coaching and mentoring and administrating young women in collegiate basketball. So there's a lot of things to think about when thinking about gender, sport, ideologies, those types of things. Within the world of physical activity specifically, we know that there are culture and gender ideologies. As just kind of a refresher, gender ideologies are gender-based ideas that people use to explain individual action in social life. This oftentimes is going to be part of the socialization processes where we learn everyday knowledge within a culture. Think about it this way. Um, I attempt to work out in the Heskett Center as much as humanly possible. <laughs> and when I go over there, when I go to the gym, um, I notice almost every time I'm there, there are dramatically more males using the quote-unquote free weights as compared to young women or females that are in the weight room. I also know that if you look at things like wellness programming, the vast majority of the participants in the wellness program at Wichita State University through the Heskett Center are women, are females. Now, with, with some of the F45 type courses, kind of loosely based off of CrossFit ideas and things like that, you start to see much more equal participation. But why do we have these differences? That's what we're looking at in regards to understanding physical activity. So if you're dealing with something like how to define programs for your entity, if you're involved with recreation or physical activity programming, then you need to identify and understand the gender-based ideologies in society, in your community, and then look at the programs and the offerings that you have. Are you trying to evolve things in the community? Are you doing what it is that you need to do in terms of offering those products and services? Again, my job is not to tell you what to do or what to, to offer and where to change and what not to change, but these are the ideas that um, are going to be very important for those that are in leadership positions. In regards to physical activity, especially with children, uh, I pulled some, you, you can actually click on this here on the CDC, this link, and you'll be able to see the full summary. But I just want to look at some basic physical activity participation patterns. For boys, basketball was the most common activity reported, followed by running, football, bike riding, and then walking. For girls, running was the most common activity, followed by walking, basketball, dancing, and then bike riding. So you'll see that how boys and girls consume physical activity here in the United States. There are some similarities and there are some differences. You just need to be aware of these as you start thinking about your career and your place in your organization. Race and ethnicity is another very, very crucial way to look at and understand sport and physical activity. Again, it behooves us to really understand the basics. Now, within race and ethnicity, we have a lot of definitions. and I tried to uh, bifurcate those definitions into basic concepts and then basic processes. So starting with basic concepts, race and ethnicity are not synonyms. Analytically, conceptually, they are different. Race is going to focus on hereditary characteristics. And these are going to be when we're talking about um, diversity characteristics and types. Race is usually associated with one of the surface level diversity characteristics. Now, what we do know is that race is a social construction, meaning it's changing constantly. So how you think of yourself individually in regards to race and the larger societal or cultural discussion about race, those, those conversations, those discourses, they change. For example, when you talk about biracial or multiracial individuals, many biracial individuals tend to associate, at least from the experiences I've had, they tend to talk about race differently than individuals who are not biracial or do not have a lot of racial heritage. Is that good? Is that bad? 
It's neither. It is simply a great example of the social construction, the evolution, and the change. Uh, one of the famous examples, and that really kind of brought this conversation of biracial and multiracial identities to sport, was Tiger Woods. Regardless of where Tiger Woods is now in his career, uh, back in the 1990s when it started, um, it, it was a very, very interesting conversation that surrounded this particular individual. Uh, he identified as being Cablinasian. That was the word that he came up with, and it, it tried to in incorporate his um, Caucasian, African American, uh, Asian, Native American heritage all into one. So, how we think about race changes, and that's what we mean by a social construction. Ethnicity tends to be more social heritage, all right? Ethnicity tends to be associated with those deep level characteristics, those diversity characteristics. Um, if you talk about being Hispanic, which is a large encompassing term that some people agree and some people disagree on the, the utility of it, but that would be an example of ethnicity. When you start thinking about how maybe a sport organization might approach this idea of ethnicity, we know in Major League Baseball, with the large number of uh, foreign-born, especially Hispanic players from a variety of different countries and cultures that are involved in Major League Baseball, they have these socialization programs in the minor league system. And these programs help to transition these individuals, regardless of where they came from, what culture, what language, what kind of social heritage they came from, and help them to be a part of not just their baseball team, but their surrounding community. And so that transition program, as they move, for their sake, kind of matriculate up through the minor leagues, they're able to take those skills that they learned early on and help them to be successful outside of baseball. A lot of this also goes back to the idea of the role modeling hypothesis. We've talked about this before in a variety of different lectures in different areas, and role modeling is one of those things that spans psychology, sociology, and social psychology, but oftentimes it's you do what you see. Young kids are very impressionable, and when they see something, it makes an impact with them. So, there's been a lot of discussion in the NFL with Marcus Mariota, a Polynesian football player, starting quarterback for the Tennessee Titans, a Heisman Trophy winner from the University of Oregon. You know, he spoke about the importance of him representing his Polynesian heritage and to show other Polynesian players or young kids that they can play a variety of different positions, not only within the game of football, but they can also play different sports. We talk about a very, very important impact on a traditionally and historically Caucasian sport of tennis, Venus and Serena Williams. A large impact there. Now this, this whole idea of the role modeling hypothesis can work both ways. It can open up new opportunities or it can allow children to think that the only options that they have are what they visually see. We also know media coverage of athletics is going to play a huge part in the interpretation of role modeling. A lot of concepts there, a lot of important concepts. But now I want to talk a little bit about processes associated with race and ethnicity in sport. You have prejudice and discrimination. We both know that oftentimes these, these two words are going to be linked. They are analytically different. Prejudice is ideas that one group is superior to another group, oftentimes a racial group. Whereas discrimination is the active component and it really creates a disadvantage for one group over the other. Oftentimes, as I said, they are linked together, but you can have prejudicial ideas and not actually discriminate. And you can discriminate even if you do not have prejudicial ideas. And so this becomes very difficult when we talk about um, equal opportunity hiring practices and how you evaluate candidates. When you notice that, you know, whether it's in coaching or other administrative positions in high school, college, and or professional athletics, that it's disproportionately one group or one group over many groups, how do you address that inequity within your organization? 
It starts with by looking to see if there are any prejudicial ideas or if your organization has been involved in what we call institutional discrimination, policies or procedures that create a disadvantage for one group over the other. And then how do you address that? Another more sports specific concept or excuse me process associated with race and ethnicity is this whole idea of stacking and historically this was very very important because what it really showed is that individuals of certain races or ethnicities were relegated to certain positions within a particular sport this is starting to change dramatically for a very long time in basketball the point guard was thought of as an extension of the coach if you, like, if you look back throughout history, the vast majority of point guards were white. And it's had to do with stacking. Certain races, especially African Americans, were relegated to specific positions on the basketball court. You saw this on the baseball diamond as well. You saw this with the quarterback position within college and professional sports. College, excuse me, football. College football actually changed quicker than professional football. So when we talk about processes associated with race and ethnicity in sport, think about prejudice, think about discrimination, but also think about stacking, how those things may be changing, and how we can help to nurture more change moving forward. I spoke a little bit about organizations and the organizational aspect of, of looking at and understanding racial dynamics in sport, and that kind of gets us into the managerial aspects. We talked about racial ideologies and media coverage, and this goes back, there's a very long history, um, albeit a difficult history here in the United States, of media coverage of different athletes and different coaches based upon race. You can go all the way back to over 100 years ago when Jack Johnson won the heavyweight title in boxing, and the cartoonists and the newspaper columnists talked about Jack Johnson, a very good heavyweight boxer. Uh, but they always spoke of him as an animal. And this African-American boxer was always going to be equated to some sort of instinctual, basic, beastly form. Especially when compared to his white counterparts. And this sort of was a, a very important historical example that we can kind of carry through for the decades since then. That oftentimes uh, white athletes, for example tend to be labeled as intelligent or scrappy or have a great basketball or football IQ, those types of things. Uh, black athletes tend to be described using more physical characteristics like athletic, he's long, he's lean, he's very powerful, um, she can get up and down the court, those types of things. Well, this brings up an interesting you know, kind of comparison. Oftentimes, how do you compare athletes from different generations? But also, how do you compare athletes, modern athletes, and how we cover those athletes? What about multiracial athletes? What about individuals of Hispanic or Asian heritage? How, how do you describe those individuals? It's very difficult. And so what you start to see is that um, how we manage these dynamics is really part and parcel to how we understand racial ideologies and a great way to really understand racial ideologies, at least where we are now in the United States, is to look at media coverage and, and kind of get a sense for the discourse and, and the coverage patterns that will kind of clue you into how we quote unquote think about race and ethnicity in sport currently. Once you do that, then you can start to address the idea of change and what aspects of your organization can be involved in change. I think what's also important is this whole idea of integration and looking at and understanding not just the athletic side, but a lot of the power within sports tends to be off the court, off the field, whether it's in ownership, whether it's in head coach, uh, whether it's in other administrative aspects. And so when you get a chance, the Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sports, the University of Central Florida, they do a, they do a racial and gender report card every year for a variety of different things. They, they look at professional leagues and sports. They look at uh, even things like uh, graduation rates for schools that were in the Final Four of uh, the NCAA Final Four last year for men and women. There's a lot of different things there. Also, the Center for the Study of Sport and Society, uh, it's, it, 
it's another interesting place to gather information about how we currently think about sport. There's a lot of different ways of looking at and understanding racial and ethnic dynamics within sport. Uh, they can get very complicated, but the most important thing is to realize that race and ethnicity involves not just deep level, but also surface level diversity characteristics. And your management or your leadership style should really be informed so that you can see where your organization wants to go moving forward. Social justice has been a part of sport for a very long time. What we mean by social justice is, is really exactly what it sounds like, is that it's looking at and addressing, through sport, social ills. Um, you can go all the way to 1947, Jackie Robinson, Major League Baseball, in terms of uh, breaking the color barrier. If you want to look more recently with Colin Kaepernick in the NFL and, and being able to... Um, speak his mind in his demonstration during the national anthem by taking a knee and those types of things, trying to bring awareness to issues associated with race and ethnicity in sport. Institutional racism is different than individual racism. Okay, So institutional racism talks about policies usually that are in place within an organization or an institution that produce unequal outcomes for different racial and ethnic groups. Uh, the Boston Red Sox were the last team to integrate Major League Baseball in 1959, and they were forced to by Major League Baseball. They had um, a, a, an unofficial policy in place. They had a, a protocol, a way of doing things that did not include allowing uh, minority or black baseball players into their organization. Uh, in the NFL, there was, oh, going back years and years ago, uh, at the very beginning of the dawn of the NFL, you had this sort of gentleman's agreement of the NFL teams that said, okay, we're not going to have any more black players, and you didn't see black players in the NFL for many decades. Good example of institutional racism in sport. Individual racism in sport, um, oftentimes maybe look at individual fans recently, and, I, and I'm not trying to pick on the Boston Red Sox. Um, I, I'm trying to use kind of examples that from one entity or from one association that deal with both institutional and individual racism. So in 2016-2017 you had players in Major League Baseball that came out and said that Boston Red Sox fans were notorious for yelling racial slurs including the n-word uh, to outfielders as they stood out there playing the game. Well there's probably no policy in place that all Boston Red Sox fans should yell racial slurs. That's an individual aspect. That's a that's an individual form of racism in sport. I also think it, it's it's worth noting that when we think about soccer hooliganism in Western Europe, um, I was watching some documentaries and, and watching some things that people have done on hooliganism and and there is a very violent component to it. And I was really struck by the 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 association or the relationship of race related dynamics during hooliganism. Um, and not just, you know, the skinhead movement, but a lot of different things where people were using soccer venues as a way to um, discuss <laughs> their, uh, kind of yell, their racial philosophies, and as a way of recruiting individuals to their cause. Um, so race is one of those things that it's a very difficult thing. Uh, if you look at the Washington Redskins, the team name and the logo uh, has been under controversy really since the 1970s here in the United States. And at one point, you know, the federal government weighs in and, and they're going to cancel their, their trademark and copyright for the, for the logo here. And then in doing so, um, they can no longer receive any financial compensation for people that want to use that logo. That's a way of sort of punishing them. Well, an unintended consequence is that there was a huge number of a huge increase in the number of high school programs that adopted that logo for their football team because now they were able to do it and not get in trouble in terms of violating copyrights. Except the reason that the Redskins they did that was because it was racially insensitive and so now then you had an increase in high schools using it. So and then recently the uh, 
There's been discussion at the federal level with trademarks and copyright saying that maybe they couldn't actually cancel their trademark and copyright. So when you start looking at something like that, and a lot of people say, well, I grew up, you know, the Washington Redskins, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be a, a symbol of pride and strength. Um, just a couple of questions, you know, if you used any other, if you need any other racial group other than Native Americans, um, I think I think it'd be very very difficult to make that argument. Also, it's it, it's sort of difficult to make the argument that a group of living breathing people are a mascot for a particular team. Yeah, it's just one of those things that there's two sides to every story and both you as an individual but also your organization within the confines of your governing body are going to at times have to address and deal with these types of issues. Now we have a lot to talk about. We still have social class and the able body disabled dichotomy. So if you want to take a break, feel free to pause it here and we'll pick up after you get back. Okay, if you took a break or if you stuck with me, we're going to talk a little bit more about socioeconomic status or social class and how that's associated with sport. Up here on the uh, upper right-hand corner is a quote from Pierre de Coubertin, who in 1896 revived the modern Olympic movement as we know it. He said, sport must be the heritage of all men and of all social classes. Really talking about the egalitarian nature of what he wanted the Olympic movement and the Olympic Games to be. That's kind of interesting because it brings us to a question and some of the basics of social class. The question really is, what is social class? And we're trying to keep these definitions very simple and very short. And so a social class can be thought of as people sharing an economic position in society. That's it. There's, there's an old adage that says um, in American culture, if you want to see the people, the groups of people, whether it's racially or also economically, that are the most disadvantaged, look at who are professional boxers, who, who the primary individuals are in professional boxing. I, don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting because it really lays the foundation for you understanding sport. And sport, in terms of how people from different classes interact with it, brings us to this idea of social mobility, is that those individuals from low socioeconomic status groups are maybe maybe they're able to use sport as a way of social mobility whether through a scholarship uh, to a charter high school or maybe a scholarship to college and university setting or maybe even translating those skills into some sort of professional occupation. Uh, Douglas Hartman, a very very famous and well-respected sociologist, wrote a um, kind of a seminal article talking about golden ghettos and and how the disproportionate number of uh, Division I coaches and athletes that go to these kind of low socioeconomic status areas and the disproportionate representation in these uh, historically white and upper class universities. So if, if you're interested in that article or like more articles about these types of things, then feel free to see me. I can direct you to the appropriate sources. Another way I've talked about social class is through this idea of stratification. And, and don't get bogged down the word, but stratification comes from the Latin word stratum, which just basically means a level, right? Or a group kind of a thing. And so stratification is the ranking, the grading, or the grouping of people into hierarchical layers. That's it. So when we talk about stratification, we think of like the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, or the upper middle class, or the lower middle class, those types of things. Suffice to say, U.S. society is highly stratified. There are a lot of different classes, and that's going to be very important for us in regards to sport. Socioeconomic status. It's going to influence a lot of things. Back in 1895, a guy named Thorstein Veblen came up with this idea of the leisure class and consumption. It's very, very simple. But it said, those individuals that had enough money to have downtime and leisure time could consume or pursue sport, leisure, and other forms of physical activity. That's it. Now fast forward to that, that sort of manifests itself oftentimes into these sport participation patterns that we have. 
we have Country Club versus Pro Sports. Country Club sports are exactly what they sound like. Sports that originated and tended, not always, but tended to be more available to those in the country club setting. Tennis, sometimes swimming, golf, those types of sports. Pro sports, if you think of Karl Marx and talk about the bourgeoisie and the proletariats, the proletariats were the ones, the kind of the working classes at the bottom of his view, uh, his structure of society. So pro sports tend to be those power and performance sports, uh, football, basketball, baseball, boxing, MMA, those types of things. And so what all of these things really do is to help show us how so socioeconomic status is associated potentially with sport participation and then eventually sport consumption. We also know from a different point of view that the popularity of a sport is going to be determined by those people that are in power or in charge of that sport. And those people that tend to be in charge or in power tend to be from the upper socioeconomic status groups. Those are the folks that help to legitimate a sport, help to create the structure around the sport, and make it popular. A great example are the X Games. Now, story time. When I was growing up, um, in the in the 1990s, the X Games were just you know those alternative sports. They were called alternative sports for a reason, and they started off as alternative activities. If you go back and look at the history of something like skateboarding, for example, if you've ever seen the movie Lords of Dogtown, um, you know skateboarding started off as an activity. Well, over time, it becomes institutionalized as an activity, and then eventually, now we have these skateboarding competition so it's institutionalized as a sport and that's kind of what happened with the X Games is you had the ability of those folks that are in the power positions to take these activities that have been around for a very long time and turn them into a money-making sporting enterprise. Not to be left out, the fitness industry really is associated and very similar to the stratification um, of, of, of sport here in the United States. If you really want to dive into it even more, when you're talking about fitness, physical fitness, or the fitness industry, it might be more stratified. It might be more unequal as compared to sport participation in the United States. And we know that whether you're coming from public health, whether you're coming from the social science background, whether you're coming from a business background, all research, public administration as well, all research shows that a holistic understanding of health, whether it's physical activity, nutrition, those types of things, poor health is more often seen and associated with low socioeconomic status populations. These health issues are associated with social class largely in part due to access to things like health clubs, quality nutrition, and even something as simple as the quality of neighborhood parks. If you think about low socioeconomic status areas of a, a large city, and think about them in your mind or whether you're, or you're from those areas or you've been to those areas, look around when you're, when you're there. Do you see health clubs? When you see eating establishments, do you see healthy eating establishments? Do you see organic markets, things like that? Look at the parks in those areas of town. Do you see quality parks where people feel excited and, and, and safe to go out and be a part of physical activity? It's something to consider. When you think about walking trails and providing opportunities, it's oftentimes when you're dealing with physical activity opportunities, implicitly you're working through this lens of socioeconomic status. Just a couple other examples of, of the fitness industry and kind of how social class might be associated with this. I thought that this is very interesting to me personally, the YMCA locally here at K96 in Woodlawn, which is relatively close to uh, our university, is one of the most socioeconomically diverse YMCAs, not just locally, but also in this region in the United States. 15 to 20% of those individuals that are part of that YMCA are on financial assistance based upon their uh, household income. About 20% of the people that attend that YMCA 
It's the byproduct of upper management corporate packages. So in that one YMCA, you have individuals with extremely high socioeconomic status. And you also have them maybe working out right next to someone who has fairly low socioeconomic status. And this brings us to kind of understanding how the fitness industry and health and all that kind of stuff is associated with something as simple as your job. IBM has been known for giving cash bonuses for healthy workers. So maybe this is for weight loss, uh, for decreasing your blood pressure over the last 14 months as you've been there. They tend to have, they've even had things like uh, they've had pilot programs where individuals had longer lunches so that it was an hour and a half lunch instead of an hour lunch so they could work out over their lunch hour. And what they noticed was that by including on-site fitness facilities, afternoon productivity actually increased. And so they're also able to um, pay less in insurance costs throughout the year because you had a healthier workforce. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on McDonald's because if we're talking about IBM and McDonald's. We're talking about very, very different companies. But McDonald's tends to be associated more with less white-collar workers. And so as a result, think about do they have some of the same types of bonuses for weight loss and healthy worker. Again, we're not saying that this is good or bad. This is more looking at and understanding so socioeconomic status and how fitness and health can be associated with money power, white-collar, blue-collar types of jobs, and then the role that certain organizations have taken in terms of looking at that dichotomy. The YMCA or the Ys are rebranding themselves. Um, whether you're talking about youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility, what they've tried to do, for better or for worse, if you agree or disagree, but they've included an understanding of household and community economics and socioeconomic status into their programming options. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about disability in sport. Uh, disability is one of those things that increasingly, while um, different forms of disabled sport have been around for decades, it's been becoming increasingly more popular, uh, not just here locally, uh, but also in the United States and then globally. But disability is a complex word. For us in the world of sport, and that's where we're going to center the discussion, it usually refers to um, the definition of a classification or some sort of impact. Okay, so an individual, um, you're going to have different classifications for how disabled or impaired your movement is. And that's going to change and be based on whatever sport you're part of. Whether you're looking at uh, the Paralympics, um, I, I think it's it's important for us to understand the differences, not just in classification systems and impairments and things like that, um, but also how physical disability and mental disability are not the same. So Special Olympics tend to be uh, involving mental disabilities, and the focus of Special Olympic is on inclusion, providing opportunities for athletes to be a part of something. Um, and they're, they're held annually. You have different regional sites, and then you have um, national competitions and things like that. The individuals involved in Special Olympics um, are there competing. They're working hard. They're doing everything they can, just like able-bodied or Paralympic athletes. But the, the environment and the beginning disability is different. Paralympics deals with physical impairment, like I said, based upon the classification system. And the primary focus is not inclusion, it is simply competition. Much like we would think of in terms of the Olympics for able-bodied folks. Disability, cultural expectations, athletics, it's a very complicated idea. Um, there is this sort of utopian view, and I, and I thought this was kind of interesting in terms of speaking with... Um, wheelchair athletes here locally or, or my time down at Oklahoma State when I worked the, with, with the wheelchair basketball team and things like that. And, and I heard stories about how um, during the Paralympics in the 1970s and the 1980s, you know, some of the individuals would cheat because the idea was competition and you made money based upon you whether you won medals and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of people were very surprised that 
these athletes, of the, the Paralympic athletes, were cheating. And it, and it sort of brought to light this larger, or this lack of understanding that we had, is that if someone had a physical impairment, we were sort of bestowing this wonderful character automatically upon them. And, it, and we're not saying that someone who is a disabled athlete has bad character. We're saying some do and some don't. They're just simply athletes that happen to have some impairments, whether they're acquired or congenital disorders. And so the focus really is on competition. Um, and this brings up this, I, this recent idea of the last 10 years, 10, 15 years. It's called the myth of the super crip. And, and it comes from able-bodied people wanting to be supportive, and so they go overboard, and they end up becoming condescending. And you praise disabled people or impaired people for daily tasks. And you sort of celebrate these types of things. And you always relate and identify the inspirational story. And what um, some impaired athletes that have now kind of, I don't know, sort of transitioned to the scholarly world have said is that they understand, they're like, I, I don't need to be praised for doing everyday things. By always talking about being an inspiration, you're demeaning me and, and setting me apart. You're making me feel stigmatized and abnormal. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, whether you're talking about acquired or congenital uh, disorders, oftentimes what we do in the world of sport is we do highlight the stories in the Paralympics, for example. And it's about knowing from a, from a media point of view, a communication point of view, or from an organizational point of view within the world of sport, how far is too far? What is appropriate? What is not appropriate? And this is going to be something that you and your organization have to ascertain, define, and understand if you're going to be involved in these types of activities. From a social scientific point of view, a guy named Bourdieu, he was a French-Algerian uh, theorist, and he talked about this whole idea of cultural capital through the body, or what he called bodily hexes. And he said that the body is produced by culture, all right, and that individual interaction with a disabled person or an, an able-bodied person is based on the normative understandings that we have of that body. Does it look physically abnormal, normal? Does it meet or not meet my expectations? And this is kind of interesting because the popular belief is that sports is a way to integrate into society and be physically active in general. Okay, This takes on a, a unique form when you're starting to think about individuals that are dealing with some of the stigma of disability. And Irving Goffman in the, in the early 1960s talked about the association of stigma, self-esteem, uh, body image, all these different things and how they sort of swirled together. And someone who's stigmatized, especially a, a, an easily visible stigma, they oftentimes have to prove themselves competent as compared to people assuming they're competent. And so for a lot of people, especially if you've had a an acquired disability, at least from the individuals I've spoken to, anecdotally, uh, if you've had an acquired disability, okay, you weren't born with it, it was through a traumatic accident or uh, some sort of service or first responder experience, things like that, if you had a, a traumatic acquired disability, they talk about physical activity being one of the ways that they can help to deal with some of the um, post-traumatic stress and some of the psychological issues in, in terms of understanding and connecting with their new body. There's a lot going on there. Um, I think what is very interesting, and from a sport management point of view, is that as the Paralympic movement, uh, especially in terms of tying and association with wounded warriors and other organizations like that, as that that infrastructure for disabled sports starts to grow and grow and grow, there are many more opportunities for people to be involved in this aspect of the sport industry. We've covered a lot of ground in this particular lecture, and I know it can be overwhelming. 
So again, I want to try to wrap things up a little bit. And first is just the, the recognition that participation as a word includes physical participation and the emotional, physical, and informational consumption of sport. You know, if you, if you think about those people that um, participate in sport gambling, it's not a physical participation per se, but there is an emotional, <laughs> possibly a fiscal and informational uh, relationship there. So participation is very broad. Physical activity is different than sport, but a lot of the, the patterns, trends, and generalizations are very similar. And we tend to be able to speak about them in the same way. Additionally, structural characteristics help to understand how sport participation patterns are related to personal and historical experiences, which will hopefully inform future decisions. What do I mean by structural characteristics? Those are those deep level and surface level diversity characteristics. Gender, race, ethnicity, um, socioeconomic status, disabled, able-bodied dichotomy. So let's think about, for example, as just kind of a case study, African-American representation in baseball. We know that there are programs, RBI program and, and other programs designed, started by black baseball players um, when the participation rate of African Americans in Major League Baseball was at its lowest in 19, the mid-1990s, um, between 5, 7, 8 percent. Some baseball players took it upon themselves to say, you know what, we need to, we need to increase the association of baseball with other races and ethnicities, other groups of people. And locally, you're able to see that in League 42, the league that was started here that attends to, attempts to bring baseball back to low socioeconomic status groups, back to different racial and ethnic groups, and make baseball an all-encompassing sport that, it's, that is able to provide opportunities for physical activity, learning sportsmanship, cooperation, all those positive things that we think about with sport, bring them to all groups all the time. Finally, those people that are involved in sport or coaching or, or some administration uh, that deals with physical activity, they need to understand current patterns with regards to some of these structural characteristics and diversity in order to help grow sport and physical activity in the future. Ultimately, that's what we want to do. Sport and physical activity want to have positive impacts on people and cultures. The way to do that is to understand the past, look at the present, so that you can make decisions for the future.